Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome once again to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and it is Thursday, April 12th, second episode of this week, second interview of this week. Um, I had so much fun last weekend doing these interviews for this week. I laughed a lot. If you listen to Tuesday's episode with Claire Marty, she was hilarious and engaging. And today I have an interview with Cynthia Diamond, who is also hilarious and engaging. And um, like I said, I just, I laughed so much and laughter is good for you. So I, I had a very good weekend in terms of my emotional health with the laughter, but also just the just the conversation with these two wonderful women talking about their books. So I, I always say this, but it's true. I hope that you are enjoying the interviews as much as I enjoy doing them because I love speaking to all of these authors. I love hearing their stories. I love hearing, um, their passion about their work, how they came to start writing, what they enjoy about writing, what frustrates them about writing. I just love to hear their thoughts on their work and their writing. So that is why I do this and I share these interviews with you, hoping that you enjoy enjoy them as much as I do, maybe even more than I do. That would be awesome. At any rate, today, as I mentioned, I am speaking with author Cynthia Diamond, who has a series out. Uh, It's called Weird Love. Weird is W-Y-R-D, as I'll mention again during the interview. She and I were specifically talking about the fourth book in the series, Alchemy's Hunger. It is... um, She intends all of the books to be somewhat standalone, but with definite crossovers, definite connections in them. This one is, um, as I said, the fourth book and Claire goes, or excuse me, Cynthia goes into it more in the interview, how the first four do have a lot, uh, a lot of connections between them, a lot in common. So, uh, there are, there are elements that are present in the first three books that would help to make the fourth book a little more clear, but I have not yet read the first three and didn't have an issue getting into the story, understanding what was going on. It did make me want to go back and read the first three so that I can um, catch up on the details that are alluded to in Alchemy's Hunger, but uh, not fully explained. So you can definitely read it as a standalone, which is awesome because I have three copies to give away. So stay tuned. And at the end of the podcast, I'll go over once again, how you can enter our giveaways and you can enter to win, um, enter for a chance to win a copy of Alchemy's Hunger by Cynthia Diamond. So let me tell you what this book is about. I'll read to you the description from the back of the book. After escaping the terrors of his dark cabal, Tony Harris craves redemption. With just one ritual, he could resurrect the mother he accidentally killed. All he needs is a conduit, a being that holds an endless well of magic. But when the conduit turns out to be a quirky, optimistic woman named Faith, his world is turned upside down. Now Tony must choose bring Sybil Constance Constance back to life, or give his heart to someone who believes in him. With the cabal hot on his tail, Tony is unsure he'll survive long enough to make the choice. Faith Conway longs to forget her abusive ex-boyfriend, but between the emotional scars and an overprotective mother, she has lost all confidence in herself. Now, thrust into a strange place called the Weird, a devastatingly handsome mage appears to protect her. All she has to do is help him with one mysterious magical ritual. 
Despite his smooth promises, Faith wonders if Tony's motives are honorable, or if his devilish smile will only lead to more heartbreak. So that is the description of Alchemy's Hunger, the fourth book in the Weird Love series. And, you know, you get just from that description, you get that there are these two characters, they have a connection, but is it going to prove to be a healthy connection? Is it going to be proved to be a connection that is beneficial or harmful to one or both of them? You've got two characters that have very complicated pasts that they are both trying to um, not necessarily escape from, although Tony is trying to escape from parts of his, but definitely to move on from. Tony's looking for redemption. Faith is looking to move on from this emotional or from this um, abusive relationship that she has been in to try to put her life back together. So they find each other, but you know, like any good story, there's that conflict. Will their relationship be helpful? Will their relationship uh, be unhealthy and and not not productive in helping them to move forward with their respective life goals? Throw the, throw in uh, the fantasy element, and you get a contemporary urban fantasy romance, which is a mouthful, but it's also kind of fun to say. So enough out of me, as I always say. It's probably time to turn to that interview with Cynthia so that she can tell you more about this series and about this specific book, Alchemy's Hunger. So let's get to that interview with Cynthia Diamond. Hi, Cynthia. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you here to talk about your series. Um, before we talk about your series and the book Alchemy's Hunger, which is the fourth in that series, I would love for my listeners to just get to know you a little bit. So if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I write paranormal romance. And um, I actually started as a costume designer, uh, which is probably why you saw those crazy pictures of me on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Dressed up. Uh, but I, I started like that, um, but I've always really loved writing books. Even like when I was in junior high, I used to write hand, you know, in journals and that sort of thing. Uh, and it just kind of stuck. And then I started to do it, you know, more professionally. Uh, I live in San Diego, uh, married to a really goofy guy named Max, who I am hopelessly in love with, and uh, we've got two cats, <laughs> and um, I'm a big nerd, so I, I go to a lot of uh, fan conventions, and I dress up a lot, and I love pop culture and movies and all of that. I mean, that's, that's definitely my jam. <laughs> yes, and I will just mention for those of you who are listening that Cynthia is at a convention right now, so if you hear a little background yeah. noise, it's, it's just ambiance. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so the book that we're talking about today is actually the fourth in the series. So let's let's start with a little bit of background on the series itself and maybe a little bit about those first three books. Sure. Uh, so Weird Love is my right now my only series that I have out right now. And um, it's a paranormal romance. And uh, the first, it, it's actually a very, it's an ongoing series. Every book is about a different character. Uh, the first four books are loosely connected together, um, with, but it doesn't really have an overarching story arc. So I like to think that you could probably pluck a book in the middle of the series and not be completely lost. Uh, and it's about, the first four books are about the Constant sisters, or the Constant family, I should say. Um, and... Um, they, and it's the three sisters who are half-blooded of the weird, which means they have half-blood supernatural in them, uh, and they were trained by their mother to protect the world. Uh, the, four, the three books, the first three books follow the sisters. The first one is about the middle sister, Adele. The second book is about the oldest sister, Valerie. And then the third book uh, is about the youngest sister, Phoebe. And each one have very distinct personalities. And then uh, the fourth book is about their estranged brother, Tony, who um, actually is probably the one that is connected. You can still read Alchemy's Hunger and get the general gist, but his story arc pretty much started in the first book where it, it, he started out not being the nicest guy in the whole wide world and then pretty much becomes a hero by the time his book rolls around. Right. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the general gist. The general gist of the whole series is uh, it's an urban fantasy series about the world that the that us as humans don't see. It's always in plain sight. There's all these supernatural creatures just wandering around doing their thing. 
and we never see it. So there's a, like, it's like a parallel world that's going on. Right. And since this is audio, not, uh, we can't see the words, um, weird is W Y R D. So yes. <laughs> um, if you go, if you go if typing in weird love, W E I R D, you might not find it or you could find yeah, something exactly. really might, different. <laughs> you might get something a little different than what I write. <laughs> And it might not be what you are looking for. That's okay, too. I mean, hey. (laughs) Well, yeah, we're not judging. Um, (laughs) So Alchemy's Hunger is the fourth book in a series. And as you mentioned, that is about Tony. Um, I haven't read the first three yet. I I want to go back and read them. But yeah, you can pick up kind of the gist of what's going on. it's not exactly a standalone novel, but um, I don't think you're too lost if you just pick up with the fourth book. So talk a little bit about, you've talked a little bit about Tony, but talk a little bit about Tony and Faith as the main characters. Uh, <laughs> so um, like I said, Tony is kind of our my anti-hero. Uh, he um, started out as a bad guy. Uh, he betrayed the family, the sister, their mother. His mother died because of him, essentially. Adopted mother, I should say. Um, and he pretty much just had a really bad go of things for four books. Uh, and then I, I decided to write the first book about him, and he meets this character named Faith, who is the key to his redemption, essentially, essentially but not in the terms of like, oh, I fell in love with her, you will redeem me. It was more mm-hmm. in a horrible, I'm going to use you because... Her powers as a conduit, which is, means she's pretty much like a magic magnet, um, is what he needs because he wants to bring his mother back to life. So Faith I wanted to create because Tony's a brooder. He's kind of sappo. He's really, he's got to stick up his butt. <laughs> um, and then I created Faith, who I just wanted to be the complete polar opposite of him. So she is a pretty sweet gal. She's very fun-loving. She's extremely optimistic. And um, it at first really disgusts him. <laughs> it's like so <laughs> the antithesis of everything that he's ever believed in. Yeah, the way um, he describes love- her when he first sees her is really quite rude. <laughs> I mean- yeah, oh, yeah. He, he thinks she's a hot mess. That's yeah. essentially what it is. And um, so they end up like... Um, like he ends up kind of like romancing her just to get what he wants and then it turns out he actually thinks she's a pretty decent human being after a while and that gets that that's what complicates the, everything for him and um and then you know hilarity and chaos ensues <laughs> so so that's just the dynamics i wanted to create between them was just that um that like not really opposites attract but so much like they were kind of the same sides of a coin or mm-hmm. different sides to the same coin mm-hmm. excuse me that's the worst metaphor <laughs> i have not had enough coffee today <laughs> strangely <laughs> enough i knew exactly what you meant i was like uh-huh oh yeah that makes okay. perfect sense <laughs> okay good <laughs> so the coffee hasn't kicked in yet today. <laughs> it was a late night last night but um so yeah that's essentially what they want i wanted them i wanted them to have a foil and someone who was as equal without being his exact you know, personality and someone he would actually go for. Right. Uh, and she is. She just, she marches to the beat of her own drummer. She does not care what people really think about her for the most part. Uh, and she, um, and she's just a nice person. She's got a, you know, good supportive family. And, and that's just how she rolls. It's like pretty much almost the polar opposite. She is everything. Her life is everything Tony ever wanted, is essentially. And I think that's what sours him so much about her right. <laughs> in the beginning. Right. So. Yeah. Um, were the, uh, what was your inspiration for the series as a whole? Was there a specific thing that sparked it? Um, yes and no. Um, I read a lot of paranormal romance. It is definitely my jam. I, I really, really enjoy it. Um, mainly um, Gina Showalter, Cressley Cole. Uh, they are uh, big influences on me. I, it, and this may sound strange, I come from a very heavy fan background, because like I said, I'm, I'm a big nerd. And um, I got my inspirations mostly from ideas like, if you've ever heard the term fanfic, mm-hmm. which I'm probably sure you have, I think everyone has by now. Um, I used to, I never wrote it, but I used to watch other things and go, you know, it'd be cool, and <laughs> get an idea. And then go, but then I'd be like, 
yeah, but I wanted to do this instead of this. And then I would just start tweaking it, and then I'd come up with my own original story. So that's kind of how I roll. So I wouldn't say it was so much an inspiration as much as just I grasp things from different, um, different things I like. Like, I'm influenced by Cressley Cole's Immortal After Dark, and I'm, you know, totally inspired by uh, Jim Butcher's Dresden Files, and, you know, and, and just little things that I just find that make me go, ooh, you know, Harry Potter, this, that, and, and it just, you know, I like kind of like smooshing them all together with my own style, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, that's kind of what I like to do. So that's, I wouldn't say it's like any one thing that inspired Weird Love. It was just a bunch of little swirling thoughts in my head that inspired the world. Mm -hmm. Which is probably why it's a series, because there's a lot of swirling thoughts that are kind of going in different directions for each book. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's on purpose. Pardon the interruption, but I do have to jump in here so we can take our first break of the podcast. But you can hear how much fun Cynthia has with her writing, with her creating of this world and these characters, and just how engaged she is in that whole process. When we come back, she'll be talking about more about the setting, the characters, whether or not there are autobiographical elements in this story or the characters, etc. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. You want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do. All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Cynthia Diamond about the fourth book in her Weird Love series. That book is called Alchemy's Hunger. So let's go ahead and get back to that interview with author Cynthia Diamond. Um, I I realize it's fantasy, so uh, obviously, well, I don't know if you're magic. I'm I'm not here to question, but are there there autobiographical elements in the story or in the characters at all? Actually, yes, there's quite a bit. I take a lot of um, I take a lot of my inspirations for characters off people I know, especially the women. Uh, I am happily surrounded by very strong-willed women with amazingly strong personalities, like just people you meet and go, I will never forget that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I love that about my friends and my family. So a lot of my characters, especially the female characters, are based off people I know in real life. Not every single one of them. And um, I... so. I would say, like, Adele is, ba- in the first book, is based off my sister. Um, and then, like, another, one of the other sisters, Valerie, is based off one of my best friends, Jennifer. Phoebe is based off one of my other best friends named um, Lacey. And um, I just, like, pluck interesting little quirks of their personalities. Tony and Faith, I would say, mostly came out of my head, but there are some aspects of Faith's past that I pulled from my own. Um, I was at one point in a um, abusive relationship. I wouldn't say a like severe one, like I wrote, but I wasn't when I was very young. Was in a emotionally abusive relationship, and it was really rough to recover from that. And I kind of took that, and I I wrote it, and once again I pumped it up much more in the book. It wasn't as severe, but I tried to kind of like feed off that my experiences for her experiences because I mean, it's something that I felt like I needed to address. Mm-hmm. Um, not just for therapy, but, you know, just something, you know, to say, hey, it's okay to be a little messed up after something like that. It's right. going to bounce back. You know? Right. You mentioned that this is contemporary urban fantasy. So um, th- that means in some ways less world building because it's set in our own sort of space. How is that different writing contemporary fantasy as opposed to, you know, having to create that whole world uh, that's not our world? Well, for me, 
I just enjoy that background. I, I, don't get me wrong, I love high fantasy. I think it's amazing. And I admire writers who can build an entire world that this, their you know, story is based off of. Um, I'm just, I'm not built to do that. I think it's what it is. I'm just not hardwired, brain wise. So what I like to do is I like to, you know, use the world I'm already standing in and going, well, what if, what if, what if. So when I, you know, when I do world build, it'll be like I'm driving down the street. I see something kind of weird on the side of the street and going, well, that's odd. What if, you know, vampires put that there or something like that. Uh, you know, and, and that sort of thing. I and you know, you know, when you get those stories like Crazy Florida Man that you read about like <laughs> online, right? And you think, well, why did he like break into a guy's house and and steal his vacuum? And it's like, well, what if the guy <laughs> needed a vacuum to make a magic spell? You know, type of thing. <laughs> and, I mean, that's just how my brain works, and I and I like that. I mean, I love. I'm a I'm an urban fantasy junkie. I love the concept of everyday world but there's some sort of magical strangeness that's underneath just the mundane and I, I it just kind of for me as a reader that gives me a little bit of magic in my everyday life to think about that right as opposed to just a, um, a fantasy world that has been created I love that as a reader but it also makes it feel like distance if I read urban fantasy it actually makes it feel like it's attainable and it feels real to me, so I can really immerse myself. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Do you have a plan um, for how many books there might be in the series? Um, I don't have a plan. It's so far, it's an ongoing series. Um, I, I'm writing book five right now, which starts the new story arc of the story since the Constant Sisters uh, storyline ended with Alchemy's Hunger. And I'm starting a new story arc that's going to be about two or three books. I'm planning for maybe 10, mm -hmm. but the problem with that is every time I write another story, I create another character that I'm like, ooh, what if? And then I'm back down the rabbit hole again. <laughs> so, and it, 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 it's both wonderful and inspiring, but also frustrating because I also am trying to work on a couple other new series that I have that have nothing to do with weird love, but I keep getting sucked back into that universe over and over mm -hmm. again. And I go, oh, but this guy needs his story. And this girl needs a story too, and, you know. Right. right. So, but I, at this point, it's probably ten, okay. um, but it might go up to twelve, <laughs> maybe fifty. <laughs> sure. I've decided that you should write a memoir and call it "What If," because that seems to be the guiding principle of your life. <laughs> oh yeah, actually, my brain works in mysterious ways. Even my husband's a little baffled. By it, to be honest. <laughs> hey, it works for it works for creating books. It's awesome. Yeah, it does, actually. I really love um, doing that as a concept. It's, it, it actually helps a lot. It kind of keeps your brain going. And that's why. And then I was like, I should put this down on paper. It just have it all worked instead of just sitting here daydreaming at my day job, right. staring out a window. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, so you mentioned that you're trying to write the, the other books. Are they also contemporary or urban fantasy, or are they a different genre? Uh, my other series? Okay, yes, actually, one will be um, contemporary urban fantasy. Uh, it's not related to the world and weird love at all. It will be, um, it's just kind of a straightforward, I think it's just going to be a, either a series of like maybe, I think it's actually going to be a trilogy, to be perfectly honest. Um, and that I'm working on right now, So, but that will be urban fantasy. The other one I'm working on right now is actually just straight contemporary. Uh, and it was just, I wanted to try my hand at something kind of different, a lot of my writer friends who I work with, I used to work in customer service to start the story. <laughs> I worked at a front desk as a receptionist at a museum for about 10 years of my life. And the stories I got working with the public for that long are kind of hilarious and astronomical. And <laughs> they're insane. So my contemporary writer friends from um, our, my RWA group, Romance Writers of America, they... Um, always are like, are you ever going to write a book about the craziness that's happened when you were working at the museum and work that into a story? And I, it's been kind of like hovering in the back of my head. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of want to do this because I tell them wacky stories about my life and my friends. And they're like, why aren't you writing contemporary? <laughs> you have the strangest stories. And I'm like, okay, well, so I'm giving that a whirl. It's been something I've been just kind of batting around right now, and we'll see where it goes and if it does come out. But it's something I want to work. That would just be a standalone, though. Mm -hmm. Fun. Um, yeah, the customer service stories, uh, just the 
infinite possibilities of people watching and people interactions <laughs> are amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I've logged every single one of them. Nice. So nice. I have a lot of material for it. <laughs> um, you said that you've been writing uh, since junior high with, with journals, et cetera. So when did you specifically decide it was something that you would try to pursue professionally? Uh, it was about 2013, I believe. Uh, 2013 was kind of a rough year just personally for like there was, you know, uh, job issues, you know, with where I was working at the time. My one of my uncle, who I was very close to, had passed on. Mm. Uh, my father got um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It was it was a really trying like personal year. Yeah, and I was and I, you know yeah you hang on you do what you can. And 2013, I followed this romance writer who I really loved named Katherine Anderson, and she actually writes just contemporary and historical. But her stories are very wonderful and sweet. I kind of started a correspondence with her via email just to say, hey, it's been a really rough year. Your stories have been wonderful. They've been really helping me through a lot of this craziness. You know, and I want to say thank you for that. And we started kind of corresponding via email. Uh, I eventually like joined her newsletter. And, and we were kind of talking a little bit. They, and she was doing a um, contest on her um, newsletter about tell a story about when you've met your significant other, you know, just, and you win a free book, <laughs> you know, and so, but I didn't see, I opened the newsletter late, so I opened the newsletter, I saw the contest, and I was like, oh, neat, oh, the deadline is today, <laughs> so I was like, you know what, and I, so I wrote the story out anyway, uh, and I sent it to her, and I said, hey, I know this is late, I'm not expecting to be entered in the contest, but I just wanted to write it, and I wanted to send it to you. So I sent it to her, knowing that I wasn't going to win the contest, which I didn't, because I sent it in <laughs> way behind the deadline. Right. Uh, but, but the bonus to that was I sent the story in. It was about when I met my husband, Max, which was a hilariously strange, bizarre story, such as my life. And um, I get an email back like two days later from her, from Catherine. And she said, she just sent me an email that just said, do you write professionally? And I went, no, I, I don't. I wow. just wrote the story. And she was like, are you, are, are you ever thinking of writing professionally? And I was like, no, thought hasn't crossed my mind. I'm just working as a receptionist and keeping my head above water. And at that time, I stopped costuming because it was becoming way too – I was a costume designer professionally for a while, but it was hard to keep that business up and work for um, a steady paycheck. And so I kind of gave that up. So that was going through a little crisis about, oh, I studied my whole life for this. You know? right. So I was literally like resigned to being a receptionist for the rest of my life and nothing more. And she sent back this really kind email saying, this story was remarkable. I loved it. You were, it was very emotional. It was funny. I enjoyed it. You really should consider writing professionally. That's and awesome. I was like, I, I honestly, I sent back an email saying, you're kidding, right? <laughs> like, really? <laughs> And she was all like, no, no, it, it was really good. And so after that, she said, if you're serious, email me back and I'll help you, you know, I'll give you the steps on where to start. So I thought, I sat on it for a while and thought about this for a really long time, like for like a day or two going, did I, and I read the email like 70 times because right. I didn't believe it would actually you know, happen because this is a woman I've admired for years. Then I finally sent back an email saying, you know what, yeah, I think I'm going to try for it. And she was so kind. She was the one who gave me instructions on how to join the Romance Guild, the Romance Writers of America, which has been an amazing uh, resource for me, for someone who wasn't ever in writing in her entire life other than scribbling down on some journals in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gave me information on, you know, this is how you write a query letter. This is how you write a synopsis. This is how you do this. It was this like constant emails of just wonderful resources that I didn't even know about. It's a whole world that I was like, oh my God, this is all <laughs> happening. And I took her advice. I joined Romance Writers of America and that's an amazing human being who gave me amazing advice and helped me work out, you know, the kinks of should you self publish, which I do, or should you go traditional, or should you, you know, and, and it was so educating and so eye opening that I just got so excited that I just ran with it. And um, I published Siren Song, the first book in Weird Love, in 2015. And um, then I found out people actually really enjoyed it. <laughs> that, that was kind of nice. Yeah, that's awesome. So I just, yeah, so I just kept going after that. And 
Um, I'm going to toot my own horn with you for a second that when my third book came out, I entered it into the um, RWA PRISMS Award. And the PRISM Award is a contest for, from Romance of Writers of America that is all surrounds sci-fi, fantasy, urban fantasy, you know, paranormal romance. And that's all that enters. And um, Siren, or, sorry, uh, Dreads Vine, which is my third book, came in second place um, in light paranormal romance. And it's a really hard contest to, like, get acknowledged from. Yeah, congratulations. And, uh, oh, thank you. And I, like, I found, when I found out I was a finalist, um, it was a really bad day at work. And I sat in my car and heard the voicemail saying, congratulations, you finaled. And once again, I had to listen to the voicemail three times because <laughs> I didn't sleep my ears. And then I just started screaming in my car. <laughs> called my mom, called my husband, called everyone. And yeah. I was like, you're never going to believe uh, and that was just, I just took that as a sign of, yeah, you know, maybe you should just keep doing this for a yeah, while. Yeah, absolutely. So here I am, I'm working on book five. So. That's wonderful. Jumping in here again for our second break of the podcast. How amazing is that origin story of how she came to be a professional writer? I mean, thank you to all of you out there who are mentors, who encourage others. It doesn't have to just be writing, but who encourage others to pursue their dreams or not. Maybe they don't even recognize it as their dream, but thank you for encouraging others when you see that they have a gift. You may never know how much that means to someone, but your words and your actions matter. And it's just, you can change someone's life. So always you know, in a world where you can be anything, be kind, be encouraging, and be a mentor. Uh, we are going to take our second break of the podcast, and when we come back, we'll have the conclusion of this interview with author Cynthia Diamond. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Cynthia Diamond. I was talking before the break about being encouraging, being a mentor whenever you can. Uh, on the flip side of that, and I'm not trying to be all preachy today, but on the flip side of that, if someone has done that for you in your life... Uh, say thank you. Remember to acknowledge what they have done and tell them that they have made a difference because they might not even realize what they have done. So be encouraging. And on the flip side, say thank you. And uh, that's enough out of me. We'll get back to the interview, the conclusion to my interview with author Cynthia Diamond. Do you have um, a favorite thing about writing? Oh my goodness. <laughs> right now, well, a few months ago, no, I didn't because I was not in the zone. I was like, um, I just got book four out, and it was like hard for me to like just kind of get back in track because I started a brand new job. Um, just I work, I have work days still, so I um, started a brand new job, and my whole, all my concentration was there. So I was like, I'd open the paper and go, Bleh, and like close it again, and like go on with my life. But um, my favorite thing, I love one. I have to say two things. One, I love writing dialogue. Uh, I come from a theater background. I used to act way back in the day. I moved on to tech theater and became a costume designer. I love listening to dialogue patter. I love people like Neil Simon and uh, Chekhov and all this that had this really distinct speech patterns to their dialogue in these plays. And I would listen to it a lot. I had a lot of musical theater background, so I always had, 
I like listening to the music of dialogue. And I'd say that's my favorite thing to write. Like, I just love writing conversations. Probably a little too much because I'd have to go back when I'm editing and just like chop a lot of going, this is, why did I put this in here? This has nothing to do with everything. You're just enjoying the sound. Right. So, but it, I'd have to say dialogue. And another thing I love was, and I'm going to say this because recently I've been working on book five, revising this book, and I'm really enjoying when you get into that moment where everything falls into place. Uh, book five was giving me a lot of trouble. There was a lot of things um, that weren't clicking. There was a lot of things that weren't working for me. And I was like, this scent feels trite. This feels like a deus machina. This doesn't seem to be rolling the way I want it to. And then I put it away for like a week, took a breath, and then all of a sudden everything clicked into place, like that aha moment you get. And it's so inspiring and it's so, it feels so good that you just can't wait to get to your keyboard. Like, I get so excited thinking, I have to have a little notepad by my work desk and do my, you know, my mundane work, and then I'm like, oh, wait, I got an idea, and I have to write it down before I forget it. So as soon as I get home, I can run to my laptop, slap it open, and then just, like, hit the road. And it's just a really good feeling to be lost so into that story that you get lost in it while you're writing it. And that's a wonderful feeling for someone like me who just loves to live in their own head. Um, and so that, I, that's probably my other favorite part of writing. Nice. Thank you. How about uh, least favorite part of writing? Oh, God. <laughs> I just went through that a couple weeks ago when nothing clicks. Yeah. Like, oh, that's, I'm one of the weirdos in the world that loves editing. Like, I love revising and editing because it, it reminds me of when I would work as a costumer and I'd be working on a piece, and my favorite part of the piece was when the whole garment was put together and I could put the details on it and the special touches and the hand sewing and the buttons and the beads and the ribbons and all of that. And that's how I look at my writing when I'm revising. So I'm like, that is my favorite part. My least favorite part is building the garment. <laughs> so I'd have to say that when I open that fresh piece of paper, that first draft is painful for me. Like, I, just, I want to do it. I know I have a story, and what's keeping me going is going, oh, you know what, but I get to put all the buttons and the beads and the ribbons and everything on it later, so just keep working on it. But that I have to just plow through that first draft. Right. <laughs> because sometimes I'm just like, oh, I just, just give me the fun detail stuff. I don't care about this part. <laughs> and you're like, but you have to have a strong foundation so you can get all that wonderful detail and sparkles and beads on it on your story so i that's really the hardest part for me and with this last story i've been doing that was really the hardest part for me and i finally got through it and now i had the aha moment and i get to revise it and do the ma magical part for myself mm -hmm. fun thank you in light of your uh your favorites and your least favorite what's your advice for other authors oh my goodness uh the best advice i ever received Two things, uh, celebrate your victories, no matter how small, and I found that so important. Uh, not everyone can write a book. It is not a mundane thing people can do. It is not something Bob down the street who walks your dog can do in, in any way, and even more so publishing a book, whether it's self-published or with a traditional publisher or anything like that. And it really, you need to celebrate yourself. You need to celebrate those little victories. And you need to just look at yourself sometimes and go, you know what, I'm pretty darn extraordinary because I just wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't understand that, how important that is, because that's what keeps you going, is going, I did this. I did something that not a lot of people in the world can do. And um, so every time I finish a book, even if it's as small as, come on, honey, let's go out to dinner and get steaks. You know? <laughs> I mean, even if it's that small or, hey, I'm going to binge watch Jessica Jones on, <laughs> on Netflix or anything like that. Um, just, you know, be nice to yourself. Uh, and that really does encourage me a lot to keep going because I'm like, you know what? Not bad job. This is not bad. It's better than receptionist. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing, and this is the best advice I have ever had, and I've told a lot of people this because I used to get stuck like this all the time, was nobody has to see your first draft but you. Right. And that was wonderful advice. I would get... I would start writing and I would always get stymied after maybe four or five chapters because I'd think, oh, you know what, my prose really sucks. This makes no sense. There's typos everywhere. There's this whole thing's a hot mess. Oh, my God. 
and I would stop. I would just stop dead and go, oh, I can't continue on this. It's awful. It's just so bad. It's just, and then when one of my friends looked at me and said, no one's going to read this but you. In fact, nobody should read this but you right now because <laughs> it's your whole you know, I mean, that's what they always say. And I was like, oh, my God. And it was like a light bulb went off. And I went, okay, so it's okay that it's a big mess. It's supposed to be a big mess. Your first draft is never going to be perfect. Uh, and at least for me, my first drafts are never perfect. They are, wow, they are a train wreck. <laughs> but it's my train wreck. And nobody else has to read that train wreck but me. And when I feel like it's ready to be seen by other eyes, that's when I can distribute it. And that, that's kind of liberating in a weird sort of way. You don't feel like oh, everything I'm writing right now, every misplaced comma, every typoed word, every bad piece of purple prose is, you know, going to be seen by everyone. No, you, you don't need that right now. You can go back and edit all of that and fix it and make it worthy. In fact, you should, you know. And um, that, made, that made me continue on and finish the book. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, you've talked a little bit about some of your favorite authors, your favorite genres. Um, anything that you haven't mentioned? Any other authors or genres that you love to read? Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm a big sucker. Got everything. Um, right now, I've been doing a lot of like nonfiction work just because I've been enjoying reading stuff like on tarot card readings and, um, and a lot of advertising books because <laughs> I'm trying to like market my book a little better. Uh, but... I would say urban fantasy, just in every form, even if it's romance, non-romance, whatever. I love fantasy, too, like Lord of the Rings style, high fantasy. Um, But urban fantasy is definitely something I adore and I'm really attracted to. Romance, for sure. I'm becoming, I, I used to just read nothing but historical. After that, I started reading um, paranormal romance, which was definitely something that I was, that was like, that's, that's the past, right there, that's what I love. And then after that, I've been starting to branch out. And it's funny because my whole platform is essentially revolving around consent and consensual sex. Um, when I write my romance novels, I think that's very important. Uh, when I was younger and I used to read paranormal romance, not necessarily, it was always that, yo, you know, no means yes, and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. type of situation. Absolutely. Long time ago with other authors I've read, and it was really irritating. <laughs> so I tend to do, you know, I tend to do con- very consensual things in my book. It's always like both parties are on board and ready to roll. But um, I do dabble in dark romance a lot. And what I've been seeing, which makes me happy, is a lot of trend with some of the dark romances I'm reading there is a lot of consensuality going on. And that kind of surprises me a little bit after, you know, the, the, you know, certain books coming out that didn't really focus on that. And then you read these other dark romances. And dark romances essentially are like, you know, I was sold into slavery and then kidnapped by this guy. Or I was, you know, bikers came and took me away. You know, that sort of thing. Right. And you're in a desperate situation pretty much. The heroine is in a desperate situation through the whole story. Um, But what I did in the last couple of dark romances I decided to check out, I was really pleased to see how it was still, you're in a desperate situation, bad things happen, but the man that you are, or partner, or whoever you are with, is going to give you the choice of, you can sleep with me or you can't sleep with me, it's okay either way. And I'm like, wow, that's like revolutionary for me. And and that, that, so I've been kind of dabbling more in dark romance and finding that genre really pleasing because the last couple of books I picked up had that as, you know, had that aspect to it. And that is great. So I, I got, you got to chalk up dark romance for me right now. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good romance. Because I've been really pleased with what I've been finding. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds almost, um, not quite, but almost like an oxymoron where you don't expect dark romance to be the, the bastion of consent, of consent you know? Uh, yeah. So, I'm not saying it's all like, you know, amazing sunshine and bunnies, but it, it, it's impressive to see the heroine have their own agency when deciding about, you know, the sexual relations, how they're going to happen, what's going to happen. Right. You know, they have agency, and that I love, and right. that is very empowering, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I, I agree, because I've read um, a lot of paranormal romance where it's, you know, it's like fated. Oh, we are fated to be together, so you are my soulmate, and yeah. you have no choice. Yeah, I read that a lot, too. 
Um, I do dabble in that. There are certain species in my series that are like, you're my fated mate. You know, like, and that was kind of one of the cruxes of uh, Dryad's Vine, which is the third book, is the lead is a werewolf. Uh, he didn't know he was a werewolf. He's actually, he's a boy next door. He's definitely the antithesis of every alpha male werewolf <laughs> of every paranormal. He's a very sweet guy, but he also realizes that Phoebe, the youngest um, of the sisters, is his fated mate. They've met in high school. He couldn't understand why he cared for her so much in all his years, and and um, so I do try to tackle that, but I also still, regardless of the fated mate thing, I still kind of have this, all right, well, we were meant to be together, but it's still your choice. If you don't want me, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to hurt me, but I'm not going to force you into a relationship, essentially, is what he says to her. Nice. Um, and, and I play that a lot in book five, too, but I reverse it where the one that gets the fated mate is the, is the female character. Oh, okay. And He's the one that's like, oh, my God, this dude is my fated mate, but this is a really bad situation. So, you know, we're just going to pretend it's not happening, you know, type of thing. So I always like to try to give them a choice in the world. So, yeah, it sucks. Like, I have a fated mate. She ran away. That sucks. I don't feel complete. But you know what? I always have my guys go, it's always better than forcing someone into a relationship. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you for that. Yeah, it's important to me. That's it, the choices and advocacy are extremely important to my characters. Absolutely, and extremely important to my series too. So I, I really like to try to give them a choice yeah. every time. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Do you have a website, and what are your social media platforms? I do. I actually am on everything. Okay, <laughs> I have a website. Um, it's going to be going over a big overhaul pretty soon, but I ha- you can find my website at uh, CynthiaDiamondAuthor.com. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I am on Facebook as Cynthia Diamond Author. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as at Sins Diamond, that's C-I-N-S, Diamond spelled like the stone. Uh, and you can find me under the same name on Instagram. I post a lot of strange pictures on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I just to say that. I don't know if you saw my husband in a banana suit down there. <laughs> that's, that, that's my life. And uh, my husband's a little crazy, and I love him for it. He's just the funniest man on the face of this earth, and I adore him. So uh, you will find If you join my Instagram, be prepared to see a lot of pictures of my husband in a banana suit and a lot of pictures of me in her costume. So <laughs> I try not to bombard him too much. But uh, <laughs> are, I'm, I'm all on them, though. And... And Facebook, I'm definitely on to. I also have a newsletter you can sign up for, and that's on my website. So just go ahead and click, and uh, you get a little, like, thank you gift if you uh, join my newsletter. So I'm not going to tell you what it is, but if you join my newsletter, you do get a, get a gifty. So. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like for people to know about your books or your writing process or anything that we haven't covered mm. and you want to talk about? Oh, my goodness. I think we might have, like, covered everything, awesome. actually. We, we really did. So, yeah, and you can find me on Amazon, Kobo, Barnes & Noble. Oh, before I go, mm. I will say this. Uh, Siren Song, the first book in the series, is now on um, audiobook. You can find it on Audible. Cool. Uh, and it's, uh, my narrator is kind of amazing and wonderful, and I adore him. And I've been, like like waxing poetic about his um, voice over acting for like the last three months since the book came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, the narrator is Michael Fieriolo. He's an amazing voice actor. He really brought the characters to life, did a great job on the book. So if you don't, if you're an audiobook fanatic like me, check out, check it out on Audible. Wonderful. Also thank iTunes you. and Google Play. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know you are at a convention, so I'm going to let you get back to it. But thank you so much for taking okay. the time today to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was really fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Thanks. So once again, and as always, thank you to Cynthia for joining me this week. Thank you to both of my authors, uh, Claire Marty and Cynthia Diamond, who were my interviews for this week. I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that this book, um, Alchemy's Hunger, is one of our books that we have available for a giveaway, as was and is the book from Tuesday's interview at last in Laguna. Those uh, giveaways are open for the next week until next Saturday. So what date is that? 
13th, 14th. So 21st, and then the announce the winners will be announced on April 23rd. So you're still uh, eligible to enter both Tuesday's giveaway and today's giveaway. It is my birthday today, and I get to give you a present. How fun is that? I get to give you a book, potentially. Um, a really witty and fun and um, sexy book, a fantasy book, contemporary urban fantasy romance. So enter the giveaway. All you have to do is go on to social media, um, GSMC Book Review on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And on Facebook, share this episode, episode 73. Twitter, retweet this episode, episode 73. And Instagram, comment on the post with this episode, episode 73. That's all you have to do. Share, retweet, or comment, and you will be automatically entered to win a copy of Alchemy's Hunger. Do the same thing with episode 72, and you will be automatically entered to win a copy of At Last in Laguna. Thank you so much for joining me. Please join me again next week when we will have two authors um, and two different authors, both mystery writers. So romance this week, mystery next week, and those will be available for giveaway as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me on this, my birthday. It's only how, it, it is exactly how I would want to spend my birthday, talking about books and having the opportunity to give away books. So thank you for joining me. Join me again next week. But in the meantime, you can find all of these podcasts as well as all of our GSMC family of podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can download those podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, Stitcher, really anywhere that you listen to podcasts, any app that you use for your mobile device to listen to podcasts. And you can follow us on social media. As I said, all of those links are in the description. We have a blog, www.gsmcbookreview.blogspot.com, and all of Cynthia's information will be in that um, post for this episode. So you can find her um, subscribe to our newsletter, etc. Thank you so much for joining me. As my birthday present to you, I have books to give away as um, your birthday presents, present to me. All I ask is that you go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. <laughs> Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Move to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.